Thank you and hello everybody from wherever you are joining us. It's a pleasure to be here today and at least virtually to be back in a city I have known and loved for a very long time. I also want to acknowledge the ancestral peoples on whose land we meet as well as the diverse community in San Francisco, uh, my home. And so with that, what I'd like to do is talk a bit about something that I think hits at the heart not only of the rise of modern San Francisco and the reasons why San Francisco became such a big city, but also uh, powerfully shows us how archaeology can connect to a, a population today, a population that is engaged and sees all of uh, what archaeology can mean, what it can do, what it can bring. And uh, with that, I need to share my screen. which it is not allowing me to do right now, Beth. So bear with me for a quick second. Let me just start by saying that I came into maritime archaeology from working in other aspects of archaeology when I was a, a younger archaeologist and very powerfully in that regard with a series of finds that were made in downtown San Francisco that uh, amazingly, wonderfully, magnificently, and powerfully connected us all to uh, the California Gold Rush and as well the origins of our city. And so my talk is about unearthing that waterfront. San Francisco had a long and powerful history before gold was ever discovered and that history as we know was both profound, very ancient, ancestral, and as well was a settlement established by both Spain and Mexico with their own diverse communities. That diversity became even more so diverse with the discovery of gold and the realization that you could get there quickly by ship. And in that, San Francisco turned from a village of a few hundred via all of these ships coming by sea into a town that, while small at first, blossomed into the 12th largest city in North America within the space of a decade. What made that happen was those ships. But as you can see in this pre-Gold Rush image of San Francisco, uh, with those ships basically where the Embarcadero or the ferry building is today, that it was hard to get right up to the beach. You had to wait for high tide and then walk through the mud and then up the sand hill. San Francisco's founding Yankee entrepreneurial uh, government officials, however, saw a solution. They subdivided all of that submerged land and sold it off to raise money for the town. And those water lots would become the central basis of a San Francisco that moved out across that cove, reaching towards the, the open bay with buildings at first on pilings. But as you can see in this picture, so much in the way of goods to, to share and to try to sell that you had to cover them with sails to keep them from getting wet. What to do? Well, you turn to those ships. Over 700 ships had sailed for San Francisco in 1849. And by the end of the year, over 500 lay off the waterfront. Most everybody on those ships was bound for the gold fields up the Sacramento or the San Joaquin and then into the Sierra foothills. And that included the sailors. So while these ships were never really abandoned, they weren't gonna be going back to sea anytime soon. So entrepreneurs took these ships and began using them as floating buildings. Or in the case of these two, in an 1850 US Coast Survey drawing, pulled them right on up into the mud flats. The first one all the way over to the right, Niantic, beached in August of 1849. These ships, and you can see them here in a late 1850 photograph of the waterfront, are sitting in a crowded mix of the cove. Today, if any of you know San Francisco, the photograph was taken by an individual standing roughly on the corner of Clay Street and, Mont excuse me, Sansom Street and Montgomery Streets. Today, of course, that's right next to the pyramid. But here, as you can see, the water's coming right on up and Niantic, beached, its mass pulled out and converted into what somebody called a strange spectacle, partaking neither of the land or the sea, but both, was the first of over 200 of these ships that would be turned into buildings, warehouses, the town jail, even an insane asylum. That waterfront, a Venice built of pine, as one other visitor said, burned dramatically in May of 1851. The fire of May 4th devastated downtown and left a landscape of charred pilings, collapsed buildings, and the burned out hulks of ships. They couldn't continue to build out there, 
So they took the sand dune hills down and filled over it. And so today, when you look at San Francisco, much of the financial district that we now know with its high rises literally is sitting on top of this buried archaeological deposit of that waterfront that was. Um, the high rises are the tombstones of the Gold Rush waterfront. In the 1960s, the San Francisco Maritime Museum mapped where many of these ships might be, not only ships that had burned in the fire, but others that had been purposely scuttled or sunk just to hold the piece of property down by putting a building on it, even if that building was a ship. The landfill kept coming and coming and coming until 1855, by the way, when the state said, that's enough, because they feared that San Francisco one day would go all the way across the bay and Oakland would really be a suburb. As San Francisco developed further, particularly after the 1906 earthquake and fire, excavation in the downtown district building high rises began to strike the remains of some of these ships. This is the, the ship Apollo, one of the first store ships to be beached, as it was uncovered for the construction of the Federal Reserve Bank in 1921. In 1978, many of us, myself included, were excited when Niantic emerged right next to the pyramid and it's this project that turned me from being an archaeologist working in more of the historical period into a maritime or, or ship archaeologist, because this ship burned to the waterline, had in one section of it perfectly preserved goods that had been encapsulated in mud, sealed from air, kept wet. They were so perfectly preserved that among the artifacts we recovered were ledger books, this duck's head, paperweight, pencil still marked Faber London, bottles of champagne, packets of good food, boots, even somebody's leather jacket. In short, a massive collection that not only spoke to all the goods that might be stored and sold by merchants, but also the power of California's gold, which was represented in, say, this label for sausage truffles, or truffles, sausages made of truffles, excuse me, from France, highly priced and delivered thanks to sailing ships, which connected San Francisco to the entire global economy. That was an exciting moment and so for me in particular it sparked a new career and a focus on ships and shipping that I've continued now for 43 years. Now while I today work on shipwrecks in deeper water, I started in the mud of San Francisco traipsing through that waterfront of 1849 and the last big dig I did in 2001 with my colleagues Alan Pastern and his team at Archaeotech in Oakland was this ship but next to the Niantic the General Harrison also burned in that fire. And as you can see, when that was uncovered in September of 2001, it was amazingly intact, seemingly empty, but also attracted such attention that we literally had thousands of people watching. And we would tell them the story of this ship, as well as that of this entire Pompeii, if you will, buried beneath the city. The hull had been cleaned out, because it had been partially salvaged right after the fire, but it gave us a good look at the naval architecture. But then alongside, as we cleared away the sand fill, this is the mud of the cove bottom, as it was with the charcoal from the fire in place, burnt pilings, burnt and melted glass. And as you see that water, that's the bay. It still comes in and the tide rises and falls underneath the high rises. We also found as we excavated and started doing our maps and drawings, that we were able to reconstruct the ship and get a better sense of it. But if you think archaeology is just about putting ships back together, it was more about what was in it. Because like Niantic, here's a bunch of wine from France, probably a really nice Bordeaux, that speak again to this global economy, to this collection of goods, not just the alcohol the 49ers drank, but General Harrison was full of goods to build and construct, in short, the maritime system made San Francisco happen, and the money made with all of this is what propelled the city forward from a small outpost and a frontier boom town into a major port that would connect for the United States to the rest of the Pacific and in time to the rest of the world. I argue, as do some of my colleagues, that this is what made San Francisco survive what usually happens to mining towns when the gold runs out and set the stage as a maritime city for the diversity that San Francisco knows, appreciates, and celebrates to this day, particularly if you consider that this Chileno 49er represents the good people who actually owned this ship and sold these goods with regular connections to Valparaiso, Chile, all part of that market 
and all of it happening quickly because just up the street, as you can see in this last photograph, people ready to take those goods and sell them, make more money, and have more ships come in with even more cargo and more people. Thank you.